Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation. My name is Mitch Case, and I'm with the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings, and more. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or look for us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. If you're interested in becoming a member, you can learn more by emailing admissions at the nationalartsclub.org. I'm now going to turn it over to our wonderful moderator, Glenn Roucher. Glenn? Thank you very much, Mitch. Um, it's good to see you. Thank you again to you and Nadine and Rose for allowing me to be a part of this event and part of these wonderful National Arts Club at home events. Um, it is a Wednesday night uh, here in New York City. Uh, and we know for everyone who is tuning in to share this evening with us that there are 10,000 different things that you could be doing tonight and no one involved with this event takes for granted that you've chosen to be here with us. So thank you very much for that. Your reward is to have an evening with the author of The Invisible Kingdom, Megan O'Rourke. We do want you to be a part of this event, uh, not, not just watching it, part, but participating. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q and A box. We would like you to submit your questions. And I do wanna emphasize, uh, please shape your thoughts in the form of a question. Uh, we cannot get to all of them. I know this is a, a, a topic that people have a lot of interest in. Um, we'll get to as many as we can. And please note, if I do not choose your question, it is not personal. We will also not get to all 154 of my questions tonight. Uh, this wonderful book is available from Books on Call NYC, New York City's only exclusively offsite bookseller. Uh, Mitch will post the link in the chat of this event. Uh, all formats of the book that are available are available. And please remember that New York City has a two book minimum law. Please keep that in mind when you place your order. Um, and now on to our author for this evening. Well, anyone who has suffered from a chronic illness will surely identify with the invisible kingdom rethinking chronic illness. Megan O'Rourke's remarkable, oft harrowing journey through her own chronic illness seeing in her vivid, specific details, echoes of what they may have gone through with their own struggles. I think it'd be a shame and a great loss if this book does not find a different audience, an audience of those who do not suffer from chronic illness yet, but who represent an interconnected society, which has a great responsibility for determining whether those with chronic illness are greeted with understanding, compassion, and creativity or blame, ignorance, and rigid medical dogma. The partners and doctors, researchers and friends, these are the people who really need to hear in Megan's story that there are choices they can make, ways of thinking and acting differently that can make a crucial difference in how those with chronic illness are either made part of the commons or are, as they too often have been, forced to navigate impossible waters on their own. Megan O'Rourke's magnificent book gives us one human standing, as she puts it so eloquently, at the edge of what medicine knew, grappling with loneliness, misunderstanding, and the feeling of the very loss of oneself. It's up to us with this book as an estimable guide to make that struggle a little less lonely, a little more understood, and give those with chronic illness the genuine support they need, no matter how long the journey is. Please join me in welcoming Megan O'Rourke. Thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Yeah, thank you for thank you for for doing this. Thank you for this remarkable book. Um, one of the things I, I thought about as I was reading the book was that getting it down on paper is how writers many writers make sense of theirs and others' lives. And I wonder how challenging it was making sense of all this while an extremis and having so much of what you were experiencing not add up. Yeah, um, it was very challenging. 
it was definitely uh, one of the hardest writing projects I've ever had. And, and as I say in the book, um, it took me, I think, almost eight years in total from when I first started writing about illness and thinking about how to tell the story of a messy, untidy illness that resisted, you know, previously accepted and acceptable frameworks. Um, so it, it took a long time. And the book, if you've read it, and I know you have, um, Glenn, does, it's sort of a book that ends up telling its own story while it's being written, right? So that was a further complexity of it, which is that I started writing. And actually what I thought I knew about my condition changed pretty dramatically at several points in the writing of it. So I had to kind of account for that and have pivots. And in a way of looking back on it, I think of course that's, that's how it had to be, right? I think with so many stories of chronic illness, there's always a kind of, uh, it's always in flux, right? It's not actually a, a fixed state. But when I began um, writing, when I was a kind of new, a newbie to chronic illness, I think I didn't know that yet. Yeah. Um, you mentioned messy and untidy, and these words sum up a theme that comes up again and again in the book, which is um, living in uncertainty. Um, how chronic illness forces one to live in uncertainty and. Um, a lot of writers and readers are familiar with a, a wonderful phrase that the poet John Keats invented. Um, I want to give people a taste of the writing of this book because the writing is as impressive as the ideas in the book and the experience. W would you mind reading some of the section, um, I think it's pages 129 and 130, and discuss how that revelation uh, affected you in the course of your illness? Yeah. So I'm a poet as well as a nonfiction writer. And I had, of course, as a poet, encountered some of what I'm going to tell you earlier, but it, it changed for me when I got sick. So here's what I write in a chapter called The Immune System Gone Awry. My life as a patient changed the day I reread a letter by the 19th century poet John Keats in which he offers a theory of what makes an artist great. At the time of its writing, Keats had witnessed his mother die from tuberculosis, then a poorly understood disease with an unclear cause. Soon his brother Tom and later he himself would die of the infection. In the letter, Keats, in his early twenties, tried to explain to his brothers the special quality that differentiated a great artist from a merely good one in his view. Negative capability, as he termed it, is the quality of, quote, being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason, end quote. I couldn't escape the sense that Keats's words about the necessity of, quote, being in uncertainties derived from his own experience of living with consumption's impact on his family. In fact, his formulation of negative capability seemed to be a key to living well in the face of pain. It was a profound insight of the sort that comes from witnessing loss and suffering up close. As the chronically ill know, to be alive is to be in uncertainty. I was grateful for Keats's words because they reminded me that I wasn't living off the known map of human experience. Rather, I had felt invisible in my illness, I realized, because American culture and American medicine within it largely strives to downplay the fact that we still know so little about illness. A doctor friend told me that in med school, he was explicitly taught never to say, I don't know, to a patient. Uncertainty was thought to open the door to lawsuits. In the place of uncertainty, Americans have catchphrases, just do it. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. No wonder that as a patient, I was bent on an irritable reaching after fact and reason. The shadow land I lived in, forced against my will into what Keats called the great penetralium of mystery, was an uncomfortable and unsatisfying place, especially since I lived in a culture that promotes the importance of triumph over adversity, a culture that insists on recovery. Thank you for reading that. I, I, I thought in reading the book, and you know, you, you talk about a lot of, of 
of, of medical professionals, a lot of doctors, that in the thought about uncertainty, that there was an opportunity to connect a doctor's uncertainty in being presented with a complex illness, with a patient having to live in a similar uncertainty with that illness. Mm. Were there doctors who made that connection? Is your question, were there doctors? Sorry, my, my internet cut out for a second. Oh, oh sorry about that. So, so the, 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 were there the, um, I thought there was an opportunity to connect yeah. The doctor's uncertainty being being presented with something that wasn't clear um, and the patient having to live in a similar uncertainty that there was a connection to be made. Were there doctors who actually made the connection between the exp your experience and experience of other patients they saw and their own uncertainty and worked with that in a positive way? Yeah. You know, what's so interesting is no one ever directly made that connection that you've just made. And I think that's a really beautiful and important one. Actually, I know I said something like it in an interview recently, which is that we, we kind of stand together in this space of search, right. And of um, being on a quest for knowledge and answers. And actually we all have the same goal, which is to find the real answer to what is causing right. suffering and to be able to alleviate it. It's not, at times it doesn't feel like we have the same goal, but I think we really do have that goal. Um, what a couple of doctors did, which I believe to this day, they do not understand how profound it was, was pause to say, I don't know what's wrong with you. I don't think I'm gonna be able to help alleviate your symptoms, but I believe you and I see that you're suffering and I actually have other patients like you. So I know something is going on. I just don't know if I can help you. Mm -hmm. And the, the doctor who said this was quite young and was a woman and um, a neurologist. And it was really unlike any other doctor I had seen pretty much then or since, or one other doctor who did something similar. And, you know, I think about that moment all the time because what it did was it granted me the dignity of my suffering and of, of the reality of my illness. And when we don't have that moment of connection around uncertainty, when we, when medical professionals sort of try to reduce the complexity of your condition to maybe it's all stress, or maybe you need to see a psychiatrist, you take away the, the complex dimensionality of the person in front of you. And I think you really take away the meaning and dignity of that person's suffering, which is something I spent a lot of time thinking about, right? If I'm going to suffer, I did want it to have some meaning in some way. Yeah. And I think connected to that is uh, what did you discover in your research about doctors and empathy? So one of the really you know, astonishing things is how quickly doctors lose their empathy for patients. I had imagined in my head that this is something that happens over the course of years, right? The slow grind of bureaucracy, too much to do in a day. We've all had our own version of burnout, right? And it's very clear doctors are under extraordinary pressure in a bureaucratic system that is hard to manage. So I had imagined it as this, you know, the slow decline and ebbing of, of empathy. In fact, what's astonishing is that it happens in med school. Hmm. And I believe it happens in the very year when, um, you know, students are starting to do rounds and go around the hospital and they're very sleep deprived. They're thrown in and they're thrown in to you know, a, a, a ruling situation and system that doesn't give them time and space to process everything that they're experiencing. So it's a pretty astonishing fact. And in fact, when you look at that, you think, well, this is something we could fix, right? We are, we're clearly trying to teach medicine in a way that's actually contrary to the very goals, I think, of medicine as a humanistic enterprise an enterprise based at its heart in an ethic of care. The other like astonishing and yet also intuitive thing that I found was when you really dig into the research, it tells you what I think any poet knows, any one of us who have kind of intuitive feelings about life, <laughs> which is that empathy matters, not just because it's nice, right? It's not just like a frill at the end of the day, it sort of doesn't just ameliorate the patient's experience around the edges. Empathy actually matters because it has profound biological effects on people, profound. And this was the part that astonished me, which is that empathetic doctors often had as much positive impact on their patients compared to brusque doctors, 
as the most powerful drugs we have for a variety of con chronic conditions, including IBS, I think even sometimes diabetes, pain management. So there's a really astonishing finding there, which is that empathy is as powerful as pharmaceutical drugs in some cases, but we're not committing to finding that and building a system that promotes that. And, and empathy also can't be um, capitalized. Empathy can't be capitalized, but you know, I think there's really a third reason that empathy matters, which is that as much as this book is critical, very critical of the current medical system and tries to imagine other ways, one of the reasons I feel critical was that it was clear to me that many of the physicians I saw wanted to be able to offer a different kind of care and were prevented from doing so, right? And I think one thing we have to grapple with together is not just how we care for the chronically ill, but how we build a system that allows doctors to be, again, embracing that ethic of care and, and not kind of bureaucratic cogs in a machine that is really grinding them down. I really I talk about the costs to doctors you know, well-being in, in one of the chapters about the doctor-patient relationship. Like, how do we get a good relationship if the doctor can't even kind of unclench, you know? Right. They can't permit themselves actually to, to extend themselves because they, I think you read at some point about, and we've all experienced this, the 15-minute increments. You've got 15 minutes to make a deep connection with someone. Right. And, right. and especially if, if you don't have clarity on what that person is experiencing, right. there's just not a chance you can do that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the... The, the, empathy, the inability, and I don't mean that as a flaw of a doctor, um, the, but the challenges doctors face in getting to empathy uh, created, and you go about, you talk about this quite a bit in the book, is the, the balance of power mm. between doctors and patients. Um, there, there's, um, uh, I, I, again, I want to give people a little bit of a taste of, of this book and as opposed to giving me just a, an answer, I'd love to hear a little bit um, about patient, you talk about patient blaming. Mm -hmm. And I think it's page 68. If, if you feel like you'd like to, you can either answer it or, or just yeah. read a little bit from those pages, which I think is a wonderful section and, and, and sort of very illuminating about part of the, the darker part of this, this interaction with someone who has a chronic illness that doctors can't just immediately diagnose. Yeah, I can, I can read a little bit from there. Um, so this is a chapter about the doctor patient relationship, which really aims to look at some of the structural considerations that we need to think about when we think about what kinds of aspects of care we'd like to happen just in a more coordinated way for chronically ill patients, um, et cetera. So, but a big part of this chapter is really aiming to get at a quite specific dynamic that happens between patients and doctors when doctors don't immediately have answers for what is going on with, with the patient um, and how that lack of being able to measure um, affects different, different healthcare workers and different doctors differently. But I, I talk a little bit about this historical language of patient blaming. Um, and I think I'll just read much of which is, uh, some of this language is very consciously being reformed, right? This is a, an area of great advances actually in medicine is that we don't do anymore. Um, some of what, what I talk about here. So I'll just read briefly. The rise of patients' rights in the 1970s and 1980s was supposed to change all this. I sort of was talking about the lack of kind of empathy in certain cases and the um, impulse to treat rather than talk. Um, so the rise of patients' rights in the 1970s and 1980s was supposed to change some of this power dynamic, leading to a more collaborative relationship between patient and doctor based on informed consent. But the balance of power is still tilted in favor of the doctor. When a patient tries to talk to a rushed doctor wanting both assistance and agency, the conversation is often fraught on both sides. Some doctors still label patients who refuse to take their medications non-compliant Regard, that's a, in quotes, regardless of whether the patients have good reasons for doing so. For example, anti-seizure medication can make an epilepsy patient too groggy to function at work. My mother, when she had colorectal cancer, was said by a doctor to have failed, quote unquote, chemotherapy when her disease progressed. Wasn't it the other way around? 
Medicine has been trying to reform such uses of language. More often now, it speaks of treatment failure and non-adherent patients. But in a quick Google search one morning, I found the headline, Treatment Options of Patients with Chronic Hepatitis C Who Have Failed Prior Therapy. The language of patient blaming is not accidental. One can readily imagine the special helplessness that physicians may often feel, the tragedies witnessed that must be quickly filed away. A doctor's job, like, like a gambler's, is intimately tied up in failure. The house always wins over time. That significance is what some doctors avoid grappling with. One of the most venerable psychological self-defense stratagems is to erect protective barriers between oneself and one's patients, the radiologist Richard Gunderman writes in a report on patient blaming. These habits of speech contribute to a presumption that the responsibility for failure lies with the patient. By making the patient the problem, clinicians at least still have faith in their ability to help. Jack Cochran, who's um, someone I interviewed, a former executive at Perm the Permanente Federation, told me he thinks that medicine needs to reevaluate the doctor-patient relationship. We call it the doctor-patient relationship, but in many ways, it's the doctor down to the patient relationship, he told me. Patients need to be relentlessly assertive and ask their questions as many times as necessary until they get answers they can understand. It is their body, it is their well being. They deserve an answer. I'll stop there, but yeah. Um, thank you. Um, the, there's a question from Andrea in the audience. Uh, did you find there was a difference in understanding or tactics between male and female doctors and then between um, generalists and specialists? You know, not in any way that it could be meaningful. I mean, it would be purely anecdotal in terms of the number of doctors I saw. And certainly in my own research, I, I didn't find any specific differences according to gender or, um, or specialists or generalists. But, you know, obviously, if you're seeing a specialist, they're, they're more likely to, if, there's, if your condition falls under their expertise, they're more likely to have some of the kinds of answers and go deeper with you than, than a generalist may be able to by design, right? But one thing I'll say that I talk about in, the, in my research interviewing, you know, researchers across the country and doctors at academic medical centers and GPs is what a lot of people said to me sort of from different perspectives was that there's areas in medicine where, where you have to, you know, you're, you're following evidence-based medicine. So there's certain protocols and almost algorithms in place. And then there's areas where we don't have information. So what do we do where there's, where information is lacking and where can we adopt a more experimental, for lack of a better word, approach to those patients who need help. Right. And this was an area where I saw a lot of divide that some doctors faced with a patient who, you know, for whom they had no answers, let's say a long COVID patient at the beginning of the pandemic would adopt a very conservative approach and say, I don't have anything. I don't know what to do for you. There's no evidence. So there's nothing I can, you know, kind of rely on to reliably, safely treat you. Fair enough. Other doctors in that situation will say, because there's no evidence and because you're suffering and because you're desperate, we have to try some things that seem reasonable to alleviate some Right. So there's these, that was a divide that I saw was the sort of, you know, people who are more willing to take the risk of like trying new things and people who weren't. And I think there's, you know, importance to both sides. That's right. so the, the, and it's um, uh, someone in, in, in the chat, not the Q and a talk, you know, made, made a point. It's like, you know, we're, that you can't generalize about doctors. And of course, I don't think you're doing that. The book doesn't do that. The book presents as many, uh, actually wonderful medical practitioners who take new approaches as you go through the course of your illness. But yeah. the, the challenge in, in, in relating to chronic illness to a person with chronic illness is not just limited to medical professionals. There's a, a question from, from David N in, in the Q and A, and I want to kind of fold it into a question that I have. Um, at one point during the period that you refer to as the nadir, um, you and your partner come into conflict over what you were trying and his own feelings of helplessness. So I, I, I want to ask, 
How did you navigate those moments? And do you have advice for spouses or partners of people who suffer from autoimmunity? Yeah. So the invisible kingdom really is about, um, it's about chronic illness broadly, and also about sort of a special category within it of people who are living with these conditions I call poorly understood conditions that often um, relapse and remit in the, you know, commonly accepted terms. So that there's this kind of murkiness around a lot of the illnesses that I'm talking about in the book, and certainly around people's own experience of living with them themselves. Um, so, you know, I think what is really, really hard is when we don't have clear knowledge and pre-existing frameworks for understanding the biology of certain diseases, we often resort to psychologizing or stigmatizing them, right? And talking about the mental health piece of chronic illness and talking about mind and body in an integrated and nuanced way is incredibly important. And I take pains in the book to say, you know, it's not as though we should not talk about anxiety or depression or the role that those things play, but all too often in the, you know, I interviewed almost a hundred patients. I, you know, again, 10, almost a decade of research working on this. What I was seeing in my own case, but also in all of the cases that I was reporting on, were people who had been refle almost reflexively dismissed when their, when their symptoms didn't show up in a really clear way that constellated into a specific disease that we already knew a lot about, right? So why do I say all that by way of getting to how, to how do spouses and other people help? Well, because I think the first thing to understand and, and a lot of the work of the book is to try to create some common narrative touch points so that, so that, you know, like a bridge between the chronically ill and the well, right? Um, and in particular, a bridge between those of us who live with poorly understood conditions that we don't always have a really clear sense of what's going on and why um, to those around us. And so my primary advice really is just to do the pausing and recognizing of those illnesses. It seems like a very small thing, but it's incredibly hard to actually bear witness to another person's suffering, especially if they're somewhat inexplicable suffering. There's an incredible quote from the 19th century French writer, Alphonse Daudet, who lived with syphilis at an age where syphilis was itself poorly understood, right? And so he was seeking answers and trying to write about his condition, which included a lot of brain fog and fatigue and neurological problems of the kind that we, we sometimes see in um, certainly long COVID, let's say. Um, and he says, the thing about this experience is that everyone else will get used to it, but not me. And so my advice specifically to spouses, and I say this to my husband all the time, it doesn't really much work, but it's, you know, <laughs> he's used to my condition by now. So if I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, the, my neuropathy today is just agonizing. I don't I can't take it. He's like, oh yeah, you know? <laughs> but to me, it's like, it's as agonizing as the very first day it happened. It's as distressing. It's as right in the moment when you're suffering, you're suffering, you're still suffering almost as if it's new. So I think that just trying to you know, engage in those moments of kind of radical witnessing and radical empathy are really, really important and not always trying to solve the problem, right? Um, I think one of the best things one of my friends did was on one of these days when I was having really terrible neuropathy, she looked at me and she said, oh, I can see that you're suffering and I'm so sorry. You know, she didn't try to say like, should we go like get this? Should I put ice on you? She didn't try to give me a host of solutions that I already knew probably wouldn't work, right? She just made space for me to be like, yeah, this really sucks. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing is like, if you're chronically ill, like, it's funny, I was laughing a little bit, not laughing, but <laughs> sort of strange moment of validation after people got their, you know, COVID vaccinations, and then they would have that terrible day the next day. And people would be like, oh, this is so terrible. I feel my husband was like moaning and saying how horrible he felt. And I was like, could you realize that that is how I felt every day for like eight years? <laughs> when next time I'm saying, oh, I don't feel good. Think of this moment and really try to imagine your way into the other person's experience. And, then, and, and not to minimize it at all, but it's, it's like, again, I think one of the things that the book does so well is it, it cries out for people to connect to it. 
Yeah. Not, not, I mean, you, you, one of the, and, and I actually, I'll ask you to, I'll ask you to talk, to, to talk about this a little bit. One of the things that you talk about a lot in the book is please don't try to make the suffering noble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you uh, exp expand a little bit upon that concept here? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that um, one thing I should have said that someone in the chat said too, is that we're talking about these invisible illnesses, right? The book is called the invisible kingdom for, for a reason. And um, I will just say quickly that, you know, in the depths of my own suffering, when I was most sick, I was really sick. It was hard for me to walk around the block. I was teaching at Princeton. I would manage to muscle up the energy to teach at Princeton. I would collapse on the train home and almost have to be kind of peeled off the seats by conductors and get in a cab and get home, which all of which I was lucky to be able to do. And it was agony and no one ever said, are you okay? What's going on, right? Um, none of my doctors who saw me, they'd say, oh, you, maybe you're just a little anemic. When I was pregnant, I got a terrible bod rash all over my body. It was a reaction to a medication I'd been given and it was fine. It was itchy, I was uncomfortable, I wasn't sleeping, but it was like fundamentally to me, no big deal because it was going to go away as long as it didn't impact the baby. Oh my God. When I went into the hospital, everyone was like falling over themselves. I'm so sorry, which was great. It was amazing to <laughs> be like, are you okay? We want to help you. But it really, I mentioned it because it drove home just we are creatures of perception, right? And one of the special challenges of invisible illnesses is that we can't easily perceive them. Um, so to get to your question though, about the ennobling, the last chapter of the book is called The Wisdom Narrative. And what it tries to do is lay out this idea that, first of all, one of the challenges of being chronically ill, I think in America specifically, though maybe this is true really anywhere, is that everyone else wants you to get over it and get on, right? You, you know, the kinds, I'm a writer, I'm really fascinated by narratives, the kinds of narratives we tell ourselves as a culture, the kinds of narratives that illuminate and the kinds of narratives that obscure. I'm really interested in, in both of those things. And it seems to me that one of the narratives we have that is obscuring is the narrative of, I got sick, I fought and I got better, or I got sick, I fought and I sort of succumbed, but in this like spiritualized way, if you think of Eric Siegel's famous book, a love story and how she dies, but it's all sort of ennobles her, it ennobles everyone around her. There's this kind of idea of dying with grace. And I really wanted to unpack that because I think that those narratives are there to make us all feel better. Um, and I don't think they necessarily, I don't think they have anything to do with the reality of living with illness and especially the reality of living with illness in a country that doesn't wanna look at illness, that doesn't wanna support sick people, that doesn't have a framework for allowing people to be sick in a messy, cyclical, untidy way, right? So what we tend to do when someone is sick with chronic illness is to try to find a redemptive aspect by saying, surely you've learned so much in the experience of being sick, right? Certainly you, you've, something has good has come out of this. And many friends of mine, so well-intentioned and I love them to this day, were like, wanted me to tell them what great thing had come out of sickness, right? It's like, they wanted to be like running a marathon. I suffered, but at the end, and I had to say like, it's not like that. I, I would not choose to go through this again. It did teach me things about mortality, about life, about, claiming moments of joy. Yes, I did get some of that out of it, but only once I'd gotten better. <laughs> well, I was sick. I was not really able to do any of that. And you're especially unable to find wisdom if no one around you is seeing or hearing you, right? Because then all of your energy, instead of going to grappling with your own new identity, is going to grappling with I just want someone to see and hear and believe that this is real because even if I can't be cured, maybe someone else could be, right? There's this very human impulse to connect. And so I think a very fundamental point I'm making in the book is we have to start recognizing these illnesses in part because we need to allow people to start to build out identities and ways of living with illness. And you can't, it's very hard to do that if you're just fighting for recognition, I think. 
You mentioned something, I think, also really key right at the end there about identity. One of the things that you talk about really beautifully in the book is that um, one of the things that chronic illness does is it it challenges the very idea of self. How does it do that? Yeah. So, well, there's the really basic way that sociologists talk about Kathy Charnez has this idea of the loss of self that comes with illness where, you know, if you think about, um, and this applies to any illness, it doesn't have to be to chronic illness, but you know, you have knee surgery and you can't run the same way that you used to, um, or you have a chronic illness and you have to change your diet and your sleep habits. In my case, my illness brought all kinds of things. The recognition that my connective tissue is very fragile, I have a variety of connective tissue diseases. I was an avid athlete and runner. So I have to reconstruct an identity that is much more careful about, you know, physical activity. So you, you build, you break down an old identity and you build a new identity. One of the things though, that we often, I think, overlook or sort of dismiss is the ways in which that identity is, is very fluid and not static. It's not like you break down the old identity, you build a new one, and then you're kind of like, okay, here I am. I've moved into my new house as a chronically ill person, right? You're, you're still living in this ongoing processing way. And I think for the kinds of illnesses that I'm talking about, this is especially complicated because a lot of them are impacted by things like stress and environment. And we have these very black and white ways typically of talking about mind and body and treating mind and body. But a lot of people like me, you know, were that I interviewed were responding to interventions around stress and food and diet. Um, but it's hard to dig into that and kind of, think about what that identity means in it, and again, in a nuanced or rigorous way. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that comes up quite a bit, I just, I just want to I'll remind folks who are watching, if, yeah. you do, if you do have a question, put it in the Q&A box, not the chat. The chat gets very long and a little bit hard to go back and find some of your very good questions that have, uh, I, I'd love to get to. Um, there's a, a lovely, sad sentence that you write about how solitude and loneliness became a tactile ever present thing, a taste in your mouth that never left. Um, what, what made it so? Yeah. You know, I, I like to say, or I don't like to say, but I've come to say that there were, you know, and again, I should say I, the book actually weaves my story with quite a lot of research, right? So the, the book is sort of telling two stories at, at one time, my, my own story, and then the story of the research that sort of undergirds each chapter, which is about different aspects of living with chronic illness, and in particular, these poorly understood illnesses. So um, one of the things that I'm most interested in my book is again, this question of what happens when an illness is rendered invisible. What are the special added burdens for the, for the person living with illness? And I you know, often say that when I was at my most sick, there were two really challenging things. The first was the symptoms themselves, which were severe and untreated and debilitating, truly debilitating. But the second was just that, and I've touched on this already, that profound loneliness that accompanied being sick without having a diagnosis. It took me more than a decade to get any kind of diagnosis um, during a period when I was actively seeking diagnoses. And so that loneliness that I'm talking about is of course the loneliness that we all do have to experience, I think, when we're sick, which is the loneliness of reckoning with our mortality, our our boundedness in a body at least, right? And sort of wondering about who we are, if the body is failing. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of internal work that we have to do alone. But there was that additional loneliness of just feeling like I was like a ghost slipping away, you know, and, and no one was noticing and no one cared. Um, and I think again, that there's this human impulse to want one's life to add to the, the greater human good, right? Um, if you're going to lose your own life, if you're going to kind of live a die early or live in a compromised way, you, you want that to add to someone else's. Um, so that was that particular loneliness that I was writing about there. 
There's, there's a phrase that you use, and, uh, and I'll ask you to, to read a little bit more. The phrase you use, which I really loved, um, ethical loneliness. And I think it's on page 108, and it's, it's just such a profound concept. Could, could you read that small bit about ethical loneliness? Yeah, and ethical loneliness is not my term, though it's a brilliant term and I, I wish I had. Um, where is, oh yes. So um, this is where I'm talking about the special sense of feeling, and, and this was something I felt, and this was something that almost every patient I interviewed um, also felt, which was that at various points, their own testimony about their bodies had been discredited or dismissed or just not heard, right? Um, again, for reasons that have to do with the structure of the healthcare system, the 15 minute appointments, the way it can be very hard to forge that connection. Not with every doctor, you know, my doctors, current doctors are the ones who saved me and got me through this, but, you know, on average. So I talk about the, um, I say, and what I'll say further is that this is a chapter where I'm talking about how women in particular can tend to be discredited and people of color, right? And especially if you're a woman of color, we see that like sort of the way you get treated and cared for is very different than if you were a white man. Um, so the British philosopher Miranda Fricker uses the term testimonial injustice to describe the way that prejudice against a group can unfairly undermine the credibility of an individual within it. It is a distinctive kind of injustice, she argues, because it undermines the speaker's capacity as a giver of knowledge. That goes back to what I was talking about, about wanting your suffering to kind of add to meaning and knowledge and understanding, right? I shivered in recognition when I read her words. This was precisely the sense of wrong I felt after certain medical encounters. It is also what the philosopher Jill Stauffer calls ethical loneliness in her book of the same title, about what she calls the quote, injustice of not being heard. Mm -hmm. Ethical loneliness is what happens when wrongs are compounded by going cruelly unacknowledged. The, the term speaks to the special pain of being part of a silenced group and the pain you feel when the possibility of communication disappears simply because of your identity. The loneliness is profound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned earlier, you alluded to um, sort of non-traditional medicines. Uh, alternative medicines seemed at times to present a, a possible different path than traditional medicine. Um, what did you try, what worked, and what didn't? And what risks were there that you discovered as you were going down those paths? Yeah. So in the book, I, I talk about, you know, it, it charts my story and my story is replete with, you know, many medical encounters, including with the, the Western doctors who really treated me and got me much, much better. Um, and the book is certainly, I always take pains to say, like very pro-science and pro-evidence-based medicine. But like many people who live, I think, again, at the edge of medical knowledge where my doctors were doing tests and initially saying, you know, we just don't know what's wrong with you. Um, yeah, since someone's talking about senior citizens and the elder being, that's absolutely, absolutely true. There's so much to say about that. I appreciate that comment. Um, I've lost track of what I was saying. Uh, uh, alternative well, medicine, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like many, I found myself, you know, you're desperate, you want um, answers. And I also, I had come to feel that what was going on with me was it was so systemic and it was roaming my body right that I was beginning to crave a kind of way of interfacing with my body that wasn't just you know an organ at a time or a system at a time but rather a kind of whole body approach and so I began seeing you know and also I was looking for answers people would say see my acupuncturist see this integrative doctor who's a doctor, an MD, but who's also using, you know, non-traditional healing practices, it could be anything from acupuncture to um, nutrition to, you know, magnets. <laughs> so I really went down that path pretty far because as I take pains to, you know, describe in the book, I was increasingly, increasingly sick and increasingly desperate to get better. Um, so it's very hard for me to in any way step back and say, this is what worked and this didn't because some things really did work for me. 
acupuncture was incredibly powerful for me. Um, Chinese herbs, certain nutritional changes, addressing my microbiome with, you know, functional nutritionists. Um, a lot of that really, really worked for me. But I also tried things that I know did not work for me. And I had very little way of sorting out what was going to work and what wasn't. And so the reason I talk about alternative medicine in the book is to do two things. One is to say part of what a sick person craves is again, recognition of themselves as a whole person. And I try to build out kind of do cultural criticism in this chapter. And I try to really talk about and dig into why, you know, why alternative medicine offers something to the patient sort of emotionally, philosophically. Right. And it has to do with being treated like this kind of, ecology as opposed to a, a car with different parts. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, in a lot of these illnesses, even when we don't know exactly what is going to help cure someone, let's say with long COVID or an autoimmune disease or myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome, there are things you can do around the edges that can support the body and really help. So in my case, there were a lot of things I did that meant that in the summers when I wasn't getting viruses, like I was pretty functional, but I would just get knocked down again every winter until I kind of got to the root cause of what was making me sick. Yeah. At, at, at some point you finally did receive a diagnosis again from sort of a, a, a from a medical doctor. Um, what diagnosis did you get and what effect did it have on you? Yeah, that's a complicated uh, question to answer because I actually ended up with not one diagnosis, but I think now up to, I think I have four. And also my diagnosis changed at different times. But the first diagnosis I got was a diagnosis of autoimmune disease. I had autoimmune thyroiditis, and I also had what seemed to be a kind of undifferentiated connective tissue disease, something like lupus, but not lupus. Um, and it was profound. I mean, it was a profound moment to get that 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 diagnosis it's hard almost now to go back and really relive it because it's that the validity the validation of getting some kind of diagnosis meant a lot to me and continues to but again this is how i you know the the way that the the story of being ill changes underfoot even as you live it was that i think when i in a way that the the arc the plot of the invisible kingdom is a plot of of sort of re-education in which I start by thinking, I want an answer, I want a diagnosis, I'll get treated and I'll get better or I'll get mostly better. And in fact, what happened as happens to so many of us, I get a diagnosis and I realize that that's the beginning, not the end, right? That that's the, the beginning of maybe more diagnoses, right? And in fact, having a diagnosis and focusing on it precluded me from seeing that other things were still going on. So it takes another five to seven years. It's, you know, narrated pretty briskly. I try to make it a page turner, but I end up with a series of other diagnoses, um, including Lyme disease that I was treated for and got almost entirely better. And that really seemed to be a root problem. I had grown up camping and I'd pulled ticks off me and I'd even had something that was like a bullseye rash and I never was treated. And once I was treated, I, my life was transformed, but there remained things that I needed to find out. And I, so I liken it to peeling an onion. I think many of us who live with these conditions, it's like, there's a few of them. We have to peel the onion and kind of get to the root cause. And that process kind of radicalizes your sense of everything, the world, your body care, what it means to be responsible to others. Yeah. I was, I was actually, I think I was thinking about the, the Lyme disease diagnosis seemed like a somewhat more peak turning point. And yet, interestingly, right after the diagnosis, Dr. H prescribes you a course of antibiotics and you hesitate. Well, what was, what was happening there and what, how does that sit with you right now? Yeah. Well, so a lot of this book is about the rise, what I call the silent epidemic of chronic illness, in particular, the rise of conditions like autoimmune disorders, right, which have truly risen over the past half century. Um, they've risen partly because we're better at diagnosing them, but they've risen partly, as far as researchers know, because of changes in what we would call the environment. Environment can mean many things. So I interviewed 
a huge number of kind of leading researchers into autoimmune disease, including Noel Rose, who's known as the father of autoimmunity, who believed really we were seeing this skyrocketing of autoimmune disease. And he and many others attributed some of it to changes in our microbiome, the community of organisms that we now know kind of live in our gut, they actually live on our skin, other parts of our body. And the overuse, the improper use of antibiotics which kill bacteria and kill the microorganisms in our body can really contribute or are thought, I should say, some researchers and there's some evidence that there's good evidence that contributes to the rise of autoimmune disease that, you know, when you have just a course of antibiotics, when you're very young, it can alter your microbiome. It makes you more likely to have um, autoimmune disease later in life. So I had done all of this work to try to, um, you know, treat my way out of autoimmune disease by healing my gut, um, by changing my diet, by moving to, you know, away from a processed Western diet, which there's evidence is not great for you, immune system, right? And trying to kind of undo all the damage that this kind of modern American life had done. And so antibiotics had become in my mind, um, you know, like the, the problem, the, probably the cause of a lot of my illness. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot to undo that in my mind and look at it in my condition in a more dimensional way and say, yes, you know, improper use of antibiotics is not great. But as one practitioner I spoke to said to me, he was like, look, Lyme disease is a really bad infection. It can do really bad things to your body. And this is a case where you need to be thankful for what modern medicine has to offer you. And you really need to take the antibiotics and then work on your gut again. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think also the deeper answer though, Glenn, is that I'm sure some people here today, or imagine some might have experienced something like this, which is that when you're searching for answers, whether to chronic migraines or chronic pain, you, you get your hopes up and then your hopes get dashed, right? And you get your hopes up and then your hopes get dashed. And that takes a toll. That's really hard to measure on you. And I think at that point in my journey, I had seen so many doctors who saw my condition through their lens mm -hmm. that I was very concerned for good reason that I was being told I had Lyme disease. And in fact, that maybe that was not true at all. And I was just going to get my hopes up and, and really be crushed and maybe have harmed myself. So there was a very complicated, again, internal questions of identity, possibility, hope going on there too. Um, Suzanne has a, has a, a question. Um, and this is, I think, sort of related to how, how people who suffer from chronic illness um, have a, challenges with people's perceptions of what chronic illness is. Um, have you, or do you know of others who have been accused of using their illness as attention seeking by friends or families or workmates? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so attention seeking or, you know, just being lazy is another one, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's a whole host of things. I'm um, just you know, unreliable, lazy, malinger, attention seeking, all of these things. I will tell you a really brutal story. Um, I mean, it has a good ending, but uh, among the nearly 100 people I interviewed, all of whom one of the conditions was that they had to have ultimately had a, a kind of clear cut, you know, recognized medical diagnosis of either an autoimmune disease or one of these kinds of chronic conditions. Um, I interviewed a woman in her late 20s who, when she was 10 years old, she and her family all got the flu and she just never recovered. And she had all these GI problems. She had fatigue, she had brain fog and her parents would take her to doctors. And this was, you know, some years ago, the doctors would say, well, we think this is in her head. We think she wants attention of some kind, et cetera, et cetera. And she told me that, and I'll never forget this phrase. Um, it didn't end up making it into the book, but I've used it elsewhere. She said, my parents were told to treat me with tender, loving neglect. Oh. And she ended up with, very serious case of lupus. She was quite, quite sick um, before any, you know, and it had been going on for years anyway. She's now doing great. She has great doctor, you know, 
she has great doctors who are saving her life. She's had two children, she has a life, but she said that those years of being disbelieved and those years of her, I, a lot of what I'm writing about is the way that when you, not only the damage of the loneliness of being invisible, but the damage and distortion of your own sense of subjective selfhood, when those around you are saying, I don't see it, and, and maybe you're inventing it for other reasons, right? That that, it's you who distorts, it's your identity that distorts. And she says that period left her kind of damaged for life, right? It's very hard for her to trust people, very hard for her to trust herself too, because she took in this idea that maybe she was inventing it all. Yeah. Um, in the last two and a half years, we obviously have been dealing with the, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, how has the COVID pandemic and long COVID factored into where we are now and what uh, I think you perceive to be a, a, an evolving at the very least view of chronic illnesses? Yeah. So because in my book, I'm really specifically looking at, I mean, I look at a whole host of things. I look at chronic illness broadly in the sense that I'm interested in the kinds of stories we tell about diseases that don't get cured, right? And I'm trying to make space for us to talk about living with illness rather than overcoming it. Um, but I'm really talking as a subcategory about what we might call infection associated illnesses. And a lot of the book is reporting on and talking again to researchers who work on this idea that infections don't actually behave all the same, you know, the same way in all of our bodies, they can behave very, very differently, which is to say that some people may be left with lasting damage after contraction, contracting a virus, whether Epstein-Barr virus, or maybe even influenza, as one researcher at Columbia said to me, we know that um, Epstein-Barr plays a role now in lupus, we think it's very complicated, the science, but there's, there's all this mounting evidence. There was a great study that just came out looking at Epstein-Barr and MS. So, you know, I was deep in this reporting about how viruses and bacterial infections can make people sick and how in particular, as, as one Harvard researcher said to me, the way that they make people sick is very hard to measure. And so she said, those people were going to doctors and being dismissed often because the tests didn't show up anything, right? And so the tendency, as she put it, was to say, look, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, this is in your head. Um, so this matters for long COVID because in the past, those conditions have been coming on at very different times, right? And, and at different times in people's lives and people themselves often don't connect getting sick six months later with an infection they had six months earlier, right? These don't always translate into direct cases of sickness. Right. Long way of saying when long, when COVID, you know, when the pandemic started and SARS-CoV-2 hit the, you know, New York in that first wave, I was really, in conversation with researchers looking at this question of could this virus also create some infection associated long-term illness that might be itself poorly understood. Sure enough, that happened. I started reporting on it for the Atlantic magazine in June of 2020 and following researchers at Mount Sinai and um, at Yale and other places and also patients and seeing that huge numbers of patients were, were getting or significant numbers, let's say of people were getting sick and not getting better from COVID. And so I wrote this piece that's in, you know, part of it's in the book. And I say in the book, I, I think long COVID presents both an opportunity and a challenge and that, you know, opportunity is too crass a way of putting it, but the scope of the problem, the fact that so many healthcare workers have long COVID, the fact crucially that we can look at the onset of these vague, symptoms that people are having, not always vague, but sometimes vague, but it's complicated system roaming symptoms. And we can say, we know that SARS-CoV-2 has caused a lot of these because we're just seeing it. That is really helping both shine a light on these other infection associated conditions that have long been stigmatized like myalgic encephalomyelitis and also helping us just you know, get funding and just see that it has a cause. Like, you know, just that it goes back to this question of visibility, right? We, we've seen it demonstrated and that I think is helping us um, and a lot of the researchers that I'm following currently 
really kind of get interested in how do infections create these kinds of variable conditions, including autoimmune diseases. And lots of people I'm talking to weren't working on this three years ago, and they now are. Uh, what is the Autoimmunity Institute and why is it so important? Yeah, the Autoimmunity Institute is a really potentially helpful model, which is, um, it's an institute that was created to care for patients with autoimmune diseases. Why does this matter? One of the structural problems that I talk about in the book and that I report on is that we live in this very siloed healthcare system where you might see nine different specialists as one woman put it, you know, she has nine specialists, she travels from one to the other. They don't all communicate very deeply with one another. They have electronic notes, there's some communication and electronic notes are making things actually much better for patients. But when you have complicated cases, you really need that deeper level of communication. And also for the patient, for me, I calculated at one point that I was spending, I think, a quarter of my work time just going from my doctors to doctor each month, you know. So what the autoimmunity institute does, it puts everyone in the same place. They're all in a hall. The doc, it's, it's like the Mayo Clinic or it's like a cancer center, right? And basically as autoimmune diseases rise, and we're now looking at 23 to 50 million Americans with autoimmune diseases, we need these centers of coordinated care. And we need them partly so that people can continue to live their lives while getting great care. So you go as a patient, you see all your doctors in one day, the patients actually huddle, the doctors actually huddle after they see you, they all talk, they tweak their recommendations, they see some very complicated cases that there aren't many of in the literature, and they're actively searching the literature for answers. And they're taking this very medical detective approach to we, you know, it's like house, like, we're going to figure out what's going on with you. Again, especially because these diseases are rising, we're seeing new kinds of iterations and patterns. So it's not a model right now that's replicable everywhere because it's very expensive, but it's an important model because it's showing that it works and that it helps people, especially people who've not gotten answers elsewhere. So I think it's a starting place for the kinds of autoimmune care centers we might see or immune mediated disease or infection associated disease care centers we might see in the future. So sp speaking of huddles, I'm glad you used that word. I, I want to give people a, a one, one more taste and it's a, it's in a way it's, it's both an elucidating one and a fun one uh, as, as much as, you know, one of the things I think people should read about this book, no understand about reading this book is th this book is in absolutely no way a, a, a drag or, a, or it, 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 it it, the story moves and there's so much vivid information in it. And this is one example of it that I think people will, I think people like hearing things that clarify complicated things. Can't always do that, but uh, why is organizing and managing care so important? And why does it not happen as often as it needs to? And there's a wonderful football metaphor that you share from Dr. Cutler, which I know is I think page 243 of the book. Uh, yeah. can, can you read that little bit? Because I, I, I love that. I used to like football until I realized what it was doing to people's yeah. brains. But as a metaphor, I'll take it. So could you read that little bit from Dr. Cutler? Absolutely. So, so this is, um, I'm one of the people I interviewed um, was David Cutler, who's a Harvard economist who works a lot on healthcare policy and has, you know, advised many of our presidents on healthcare and how to create better healthcare policy. And um, let's see, where is it? Uh, yeah, so, so, so we talked about, you know, how do we actually create solutions, right? Because part of the book is, um, I'm glad you said that. I, I did try to write it as a detective novel, but it also tries to have solutions about sort of structural solutions at the end, more than personal ones. And he says, you know, we know that when doctors work closely with their patients, they get better outcomes, but how do we incentivize that? And what is the problem, you know, and I asked him why no one has really invented this kind of health planning that he was advocating for chronic illness. Um, and he said, doctors are not trained to do this. A doctor is trained like a tradesman. A surgeon is trained to cut you open. A plumber is trained to fix your pipes. A dermatologist is trained to check your skin. They're not trained to manage you. So someone has to step into that role. That's the biggest missing thing in healthcare in part because the economics don't work or haven't worked. You know, the GP is supposed to do that, but it doesn't always happen that way. 
then he says, what always strikes me, who are the three highest paid people on the football team? The quarterback, the left tackle, the person who protects the quarterback from the blind side, and the coach. What the hell is the coach getting paid for? <laughs> he never touches the ball during the game. He's not very fit, but he's bringing everything together and he's paid to bring it all together. No one is doing this for our health. And he goes on to say, how are we going to do that? We need the kind of quarterback, the, sorry, the coach model. of. And, and in fact, there are now organizations that are trying to bring that um, model into practice. I've been contacted by places like Parsley Health or MyMe, which is a, uh, a site, a, an app really that works to be that coach for autoimmune patients. The problem is that those of us who have access to that usually are pretty well resourced and privileged to begin with, right? So how do we scale that kind of coach model to a really, really broad, um, you know, a huge population? Someone's asking, what would, I think, what would that coaching look like? In the case of Parsley and Miami and some of these autoimmune apps that they're trying to build, it's that, you know, because we know that symptoms relapse and remit, we have the sense that things are triggering symptoms and things are making some of the illnesses worse. Other things maybe are helping ameliorate or helping manage symptoms. So there's a lot of personalized work people can do um, to help manage their own flares, right? And a lot of it has to do with diet, sleep, stress. So some of these apps really step in to help kind of build out a first help you recognize, oh, every time I ate eggs, I felt terrible the next day. And then also to have someone come in and really help work with you on the kind of making changes piece, which is really, really hard. It's really hard to make changes. Um, and then also to kind of do lab work and evaluate it together and say, okay, here are the top three goals. You have these 12, 12 symptoms, but we can only deal with one thing at a time. Here's the top three, how are we going to do that? But, but before I ask my, what I think would be, it will be a, a hopefully a good last question. Uh, I just want to, again, remind people that you can purchase this remarkable book, The Invisible Kingdom, Reimagining Chronic Illness by Megan O'Rourke from Books on Call NYC through the link in the chat. And I know that Mitch is brilliant and is right now about to paste it back in the chat. So it's right there for you. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for attending tonight. Again, we know there's other things you can be doing. Um, I, I, I know you have as enjoyed as much as I have hearing from Megan. I, I want to finish by asking, you explain that you were fiercely determined not to give false assurances. Mm -hmm. Why was that important? And how did you manage to stick to it? Because I think the last chapter I mentioned to you separately, uh, the last chapter is one of the most remarkable chapters of, of writing uh, and ideas that I've read in a long time. And I read a lot. How did, you, how, how did you, how did you stick that landing? You know, I just had this commitment to tell the truth. I don't know. It's like I come from a family of stubborn Irish American folk <laughs> to like tell jokes and tell the truth. <laughs> well, except when they don't, but you know, I think that chapter was the easiest for me to write because it, it's such a, um, it was so clear to me that I really wanted to, it was easiest and hard because the end of the book and I, I wanted to make the book feel like it had an end, but I had to say quite explicitly to the reader, like you're gonna be looking for an ending here that's not exactly the kind of ending you're gonna get. You're gonna get this other ending instead. And that's where the, resistance to false assurances comes in. And I think part of it is that I do think the book is not gloomy. I think it's hopeful. I'm an optimist that we can do better. We can absolutely impact society and one another's lives for the better by witnessing like the, <clears throat> the gentleman who asked about being, I think it was a gentleman, asked about being a better spouse, right? We, we all have individual power and we have this kind of social power to change narratives. And so I think that was why I didn't have to give false assurances because I think there's real assurances that are there to be acted on. Great. Megan, thank you so much for this. Um, I, I, I so encourage everyone watching to both get this book, read this book. Um, it, it, there's hardly a family that has not been does not or a person that does not know someone who 
this book would matter to in a very, very deep way. Megan, our audience, thank you so much. Um, everyone have a good night and take care of each other. Thank you, Megan, so thank much. You all. Thank you all so much. Good night. Good night.